for the day is to lead thoughtful discussions on the barriers we face uh, and help us gain deeper understanding of the solutions. To start things off, I'd like you guys to give a warm welcome to our provost and chief academic officer, Allison Hilsebeck. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've uh, had an opportunity to already have some really uh, engaging conversation this morning. I hope you have too, and I hope the day continues to go on that way. I'd like to welcome you to National Lewis University. Um, we're an independent nonprofit institution founded by Elizabeth Harrison, who was one of the pioneers in the kindergarten movement. And as she began building teacher prep, a teacher preparation institution 128 years ago, she consciously also created a career pathway for young women in teaching, many of whom were immigrants and first generation college students. And while we have become a more comprehensive university over time with 62 programs from the baccalaureate to the doctoral level, NLU's path has continued to honor our founders' commitment to educate professionals and to create and support both access and success in higher education. This year, we launched our Harrison Professional Pathways program, which is an undergraduate degree designed to be affordable offer a clear and straightforward pathway to the baccalaureate, leverage adaptive technologies to support learners, and provide wraparound services with holistic advising and coaching. We welcomed our first freshman class this fall, so fun, uh, which is majority first generation and close to 100% underrepresented minority students. As we'll hear from our speaker uh, today, higher education is in the midst of significant change. Questions about the nature and value of higher ed are being raised across the nation. Technology and learning sciences are rapidly changing the landscape of learning. And our mission to educate has been broadened, broadened and made more urgent as the shifting global economy increasingly rewards flexible knowledge workers and increasingly marginalizes those without a post-secondary degree. We're in this room together first and foremost because we care deeply about students and their educations and their futures. So as we launch our own reengineering of undergraduate education, we are humbled and encouraged by our contacts with the broader network of organizations and institutions working on these same issues. We believe we have much to learn from each other and that it is more crucial than ever that we come together to support common goals and to leverage each other's strengths. We're deeply appreciative of your willingness to engage with us around these important issues of increasing access and success in higher education. This conference was born from a discussion about the implications of the National Common Core curriculum and its likely impact on students' transition from high school to college. At NLU, we redesigned our undergraduate gen ed uh, curriculum using the Lumina degree qualifications profile and AAC and use LEAP learning outcomes. We also aligned it to the Common Core and we wondered how the Common Core might be scaffolded and leveraged to support student success in college. We were also encouraged by efforts at peer institutions to surround the curricula with advising and coaching that recognize the importance of non-cognitive as well as academic factors in student learning and, and success. And we came to appreciate how innovative technologies and research on human learning and development were beginning to transform the landscape, the very landscape of teaching and learning in higher ed, and to wonder how our colleagues at forward-looking institutions and organizations were exploiting these forces and leveraging them to improve academic outcomes for students. Finally, in today's higher education environment, where liberal arts programs are often criticized for not preparing students for the job market, and professional and vocational programs are criticized for new, too narrowly training students in industry skills that may be outdated before they even graduate, what is the content of higher education supposed to look like? Will the Common Core foster greater college readiness on a broad scale? Can alignment of gen eds to the Common Core potentially help the often bumpy transition from high school to college? And how does an extension of the Common Core into higher ed align with the DQP and LEAP learning outcomes, and how might all of that influence the substance of post-secondary preparation? We're in the midst of a lot of headwinds and a lot of change. We don't pretend to have all the answers at NLU, 
but we do have confidence that by reaching out and collaborating across our networks of knowledge and experience, we can together find many of those answers. It's our hope that today's conference will foster and deepen these relationships and networks and help all of us succeed in improving higher ed and creating more opportunity for students. So thank you, thank you for taking the time to be part of this conversation and to engage with us. I hope you find it very worthwhile and I hope we build relationships and friendships that will help us together support students to greater success. Thank you. Now, please welcome Naveen Magahed, the president of National Lewis University. Good morning. I uh, am, get the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, Dr. Mitchell Stevens. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. So we had dinner last night, and the whole time I'm trying to get him to tell me about himself but he completely controlled the conversation and just pumped us for information all night long. And I had this intent like, okay, I'm gonna have the juice on this guy, and in the morning I'm gonna give th th this great introduction about who he really is. And that's not what you're gonna get because he is a master of understanding education and asking everyone everything they know about education so that he can use it to continue to inform his work. So you're, you, you beat me on that one. So I'm gonna give you the more generic introduction. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Mitchell Stevens is the director of the Center for Advanced Research through Online Learning, uh, an associate professor of education, and by courtesy, sociology at Stanford University. He's actually a sociologist by training, so I'm not sure who's giving who the courtesy that you're in that department. Um, he is a co-editor of Remaking College, The Changing Ecology of Higher Education, a profuse writer, and he's currently completing a book on how U.S. universities organize research and teaching around the rest of the world. But more broadly, he's thinking about how universities are being reorganized nationally and globally as the political economy of our entire sector shifts towards private capital. Dr. Stevens studies and understands the changing ecology in higher education perhaps better than anybody. He understands that there's a new demographic that is emerging. He understands that there's a push for increased accountability and greater efficiency in, in, in educational models. He's, he's deeply aware of the impact of digital tools and how they can be leveraged to impact education. He understands the nonlinear nature of learning particularly in a context of global comp competition and the ever-increasing demand uh, and need for educated workers. He's truly a pioneer who brings an empirical perspective. He brings a policy perspective. He is steeped in the sociological context of a global economy. And this combination is a unique and amazing combination of skills and perspectives to have in one man. So today we, get, we are the recipient of these multiple perspectives as he speaks to us about education. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell Stevens. Thanks, Nadine. Are you ready to go? Thanks, Rosa. Well, I tell you, I didn't know how impressive I really was until, <laughs> until Naveen here. Um, I'm going to have to speak with my psychotherapist when I get back. It's, uh, it's really, a, it's really a pleasure to be back in Chicago. I, um, I came of age as a, a scholar here in graduate school at Northwestern University. And uh, in fact, uh, one of my most important mentors uh, is a, a National Lewis uh, former faculty member. She's here, actually. Her name is Eileen Eisenberg. Uh, would you stand, please, Eileen? Worked for many years in the McCormick Center uh, uh, on National Lewis's um, broad efforts to enhance the professional quality of early childhood educators and child care provision here in the city. Uh, her colleague, uh, Paula Jordy Bloom, who recently retired, gave me an, uh, did me the courtesy of uh, offering an, an informational interview, which I vividly remember because it's only the second one I ever had. I've never even paid a dollar in tuition to National Lewis University, and I'm already indebted to your faculty. So it's, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to come back to this beautiful city with its spectacular architecture. It's never looked taller or cleaner. Um, I know you have some, some financial 
puzzles, but don't we all? Um, uh, it, it, looks, it looks good on the surface, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, the, first, that's the first rule. I want to talk to you today about, um, about this very turbulent uh, period of time. We're from very different kind, lots of different institutions are represented in this room. And one, of the, one of the great virtues of higher education, uh, in my opinion, in the United States is its extraordinary diversity. Um, its ability to l do lots of different things and accommodate lots of different kinds of people um, and uh, uh, forward lots of different kinds of local and national and regional ambitions. Uh, until very recently, the, the variety of the sector has really encouraged us to not th think cross-categorically. We've tended to think about schools that are very much like our own to the exclusion of, of thinking about, uh, about um, others in the ecology. And the, the great turbulence uh, that Allison mentioned earlier is a moment in which we can't kind of take that ca those categorical inheritances for granted. And we have to think in new ways about who our peers are um, and how we might uh, best and most productively cooperate. So um, I see uh, this kind of conversation as, as really uh, important um, and, a, and a historical opportunity. Um, I am selling books. This is an edited volume uh, that uh, came out of a project that also was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation between 2010 and 2013. Uh, early in the Gates Foundation's post-secondary portfolio. And the goal of that project uh, was to assemble social scientists nationally and ask, and ask ourselves, you know, what would our scholarly understanding of higher education look like if we presumed that Chicago State University, the College of DuPage, and DeVry University were the primary providers of higher education in this country. If schools like that were the primary providers of higher education in this country, and we took that seriously, what would our scholarly appreciation of higher education look like? Well, of course, those schools do educate the vast majority of, of college attendees in this country. They have for decades. Uh, but what social scientists call an elite bias uh, has gotten many of us to imagine that the right kind of college is, 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 a, is a somewhat selective four-year residential uh, uh, facility that, with a lot of green lawns and ideally a water polo team. And if you don't have that bundle of assets, then you're kind of some other kind of school. Um, and, and that elite bias has really you know, prevented a, a lot of us, um, from a, a lot of scholars and a lot of families, I think, from kind of understanding the great variety um, of, of higher education uh, in this country. And so it was, um, uh, that was a three-year project, which was ex extraordinarily humbling, because I had spent basically my whole professional life in higher education. But, um, as, one, as, an, as a colleague of mine said, Mitchell, have you ever been inside of a community college? <laughs> yes, I have been inside of a community. But uh, uh, and the, the, just how dramatically different the sector was and how people um, who lived in my part of the ecology um, had, had, had much less understanding of the sector um, than we should. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one product that came out of it. I don't have to sell you the book, thankfully, because um, the whole introduction is available um, online from the press um, uh, gratis. And if you want, you can drop me a line and I'll send you one. So I think that, that, that's the, the last few years at Stanford is, is what kind of encouraged me to, to do some of this thinking. And I'm specifically grateful, too, to my colleagues at Foothill College in De Anza, um, right next door um, at Stanford. So what do I mean by ecology? Let's start with a simple, simple definition. I found this one on the web. You're welcome to find, I hope you're surfing the web while, while we're doing this. I hope you're you know, checking your email when it gets boring. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, what do I mean by ecology? This is just a Merriam-Webster definition. Um, uh, by ecology, I mean the relationship between a group of living things and their environment. The relationship between a group of living things and their environment. The ecology of higher education, an ecology of colleges and organizations, an ecology of schools, a population of schools, a community of schools, okay? We don't think about schools enough. We're so busy thinking about students, our students, the students' needs, persistence and completion, that we forget about our schools. 
It's like, it's like the parent who is exhausted because she's always thinking about her children and she forgets to think about herself. <laughs> what are my needs? How am I feeling? How do I operate? Right? We have a tendency, I think, in higher education policy and planning to be sort of so focused on our students that we forget that we too are living things. National Lewis University is a living thing. It has needs, it has feelings, it has to pay bills, it can be re reluctant to change, it has bad days, right? It's a living thing and it exists in a, an ecology of other living things and works to survive and flourish and find its niche relative to other organizations. That's the perspective I want to emphasize for you today. Uh, and I think it's a, for me, it's been a very uh, s s uh, important intellectual opportunity because we've, we actually don't think about colleges and universities as much as we should in the United States. And my personal sense is that because we, we trust them a lot and we often love them, you know, we put the names of our schools on our children and our cars. <laughs> we really have a strong affection for our schools and we, and we trust them to do the right thing, which is, which is fine, except w where does that trust come from? Why do we love schools so much? Um, those kinds of questions, um, I think, are especially important to ask um, as, we, as we're in a period of, of spectacular change. Um, and actually, we're not just talking about living things in one environment, we're talking about living things in several environments. National Lewis University is proudly a citizen, an organizational citizen of Chicago and, and needs to find its place in Northern Illinois, certainly. Um, but it's also, um, Seattle is here today, right? It's Washington may be here today. Uh, Tennessee is here today, right? There we go. So, right, uh, they have to think about, you have to think about your own region, but you have to think also about this sort of larger environment. Um, in which uh, you need to compete and cooperate. And um, especially because of this thing called the World Wide Web, you know, kind of who knows what the next organizational member of your community is gonna be. Um, so, so we have to think simultaneously about um, you know, membership and ecologies at several different levels. Um, what do I wanna do today? Um, I wanna make basically four points, uh, four chunks. I wanna talk a little bit about the past um, we don't believe in history very much in California, but it turns out it does matter. <laughs> turns out the, present li the past lives in the present. Anyone who's been married for a number of years knows what I'm talking about. The past is always there, whether you acknowledge and recognize it or not. So we may as well acknowledge and recognize the past and think about how the past imprints what we currently do and how we assume higher education should work. Um, I want to suggest why delivering higher education is really harder now than ever before um, in national history. Uh, it's a really tough job. I want to give you some, some sense of where I think the, the post-secondary sector is headed in the United States. Um, and then also because I'm from California, I have to end on an optimistic note and I need to remind you that, um, that turbulence um, is, is a great opportunity. And actually, I actually believe that. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about the ways in which um, organizations like yours and mine, um, I, think it's a really good, I think it's a really good time to be in higher education, actually. It may not be a really good time to be looking for a tenure track job in a di disciplinary department at the core of a college or university. It may be a crummy time to want to be a, a tenured English professor. But for anybody else, just about anybody else, it's, it's a really, really interesting, interesting time. Um, do, 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 do. All right, so first, three epic, oh, and I'm not gonna, I wanna be sure, I'm looking at my watch, I'm gonna be sure that we have a good bit of time for discussion, so I'm gonna try and limit my remarks to 20 minutes, something like that, and then we'll have a good uh, 15, 20 minutes to have interaction. Um, and I really need to hear from you because uh, one of the things that uh, I'm charged with doing over the next year or so is, um, helping Stanford think about what role it should play in the national higher education community, what, what, uh, what, what things it could do to, to add civic value to the, to the ecology and fabric of the sector. It's not immediately clear to, to us what that should be. We're pretty sure, for example, that, that 
uh, instructors at National U Lewis University know a lot better than Stanford professors what students in their classrooms need. They don't need us <laughs> delivering instruction for them. So uh, the value add that Stanford can bring to, the, to, to this sector of the ecology is, is certainly can't replace the instructional capacity um, that's represented in this room. But we might have, we might be able to make some strategic contributions um, uh, to the efforts under discussion here that would, um, that would enable us to contribute to the improvement of the sector. So we truly don't know what, what those contributions might be. So if you could sort of, that's, that's kind of my, part of my investment in coming. Okay, so three epics of U.S. higher education. This is going to be a schoolhouse rock version of a complicated story, but sometimes schoolhouse rock pictures can be, can be useful for discussion, okay? So we're going to divide a complicated history into three epics, um, not specifically bounded by time. In fact, that will become important um, later on. Um, no, no, no one epic entirely disappears. It's like a, it's like a, a layered archaeology. I just had a 10-year anniversary, so I'm thinking about this sort of thing, right? My relationship is different now than it was five years ago, but the way it was five years ago still is imprinted in what it is like now, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a little bit the same and a little bit different. Um, so these epics are kind of like uh, layers in an archaeological stratum that our organizations in inherit. Um, all right, so uh, epic one, I'm going to be, there's three. There's associational, national service, and market. Associational is the earliest one. Um, uh, it's basically from the beginning of higher education in this country with the founding of Harvard College and the College of William and Mary uh, in the uh, 17th century. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it probably has occurred to you, you learned it in your civics class, that, that the United States is populated by religious radicals and business people and business people who are religious radicals. All right? The early colonial America was essentially a religious and or business proposition. That's why people went out of their way to stake out a new future in this world. And so the commitment to religious freedom uh, and, re and freedom of religious association is, is one of the most important drivers of higher education founding in this country. People came here to be religiously committed and they founded schools partly to train clergy and teachers right, to civilize a new world, reason number one. They also founded schools to impress people back east, right? In one sense, Harvard College was built to impress people back east. Where was back east in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1750? Cambridge, England, yes, Europe. We're not Philistines, right? We can read and write. We speak German and Latin and Greek. We have some art here, right? We're not just religious nuts and business people on the edge of the world. We're actually sophisticated people. See, we have Harvard, right? Which way is, which way is west for you guys? This is... This is, okay, stage left is east, right? Impress people back east, right? And, then, and then, it's, then it's 1890, and you're in Chicago, and you're John D. Rockefeller. And you know what? You want to impress people back east, <laughs> right? What do you do? You build the University of Chicago, which looks 500 years old, from the moment that it's baked, right? Right, right. If, if that doesn't impress people back east. Oh, but then maybe you're Leland Stanford, right? And what do you want to do? You want to impress people back east, right? Right? You want to get the attention of a skeptical eastern establishment. So you take your 8,000-acre horse farm and you hire Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, to lay out something that looks like a, an Italian country version of Versailles in California, okay? It's something to take pictures of and send 
back east. Okay? Now, schools do this all the time. I'm, one of the reasons, I, the, the, it's amazing to me that the efflorescence of a community of, of uh, broad access institutions here in the loop, it's amazing. Roosevelt, Columbia, National Lewis, Medgar Evers, DePaul, and, and those schools are working hard to impress you too. Roosevelt University builds this jagged blue ziggurat on South Michigan Avenue. National Lewis University uh, renovates a spectacular historic building. The schools are kind of competing with each other for the sexiness of their lobbies, right? right? We're trying to impress people. That's one of the things that schools do. They're, they are things for communities to be proud of. They're things to feel good about. They're civic institutions. So we have a lot of schools. We have a lot of schools because we have a lot of religions. We have a lot of schools because of Western expansion and a desire to, um, uh, to, Im to consistently impress people back east. And in fact, one of the reasons we want to impress people back east, this is one of my favorites, is because the people back east don't know where they should go, right? If it's like 1895 and you're a banker in Boston, you know, it's all the Midwest to you. What do you know? St. Louis, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Chicago, Buffalo, I don't know. It's just over there, right? But a school, a school says, this is a someplace. We're a real someplace. See, we got this thing. We have this civic asset that you can pay attention to. Um, so one of the big reasons we have so many schools in the United States is because of this, um, basically, a competition um, for status and attention um, as the Western expand, uh, frontier expands. At the same time, I say that this is an entrepreneurial anarchy. There are no rules. We're a nation of school builders. Anyone can start a school, pretty much, especially in higher education. Um, it's really easy to start a school and get a charter. And, and, and there really weren't any rules about who could and who couldn't. And there wasn't some ancient university like Oxford and Cambridge that kind of locked up uh, you know, the monopoly on all the smart people. So you, you, it, was, it was an ongoing competition um, for students and prestige. Um, and uh, this is why, why we call it, uh, my colleagues and I call it anarchic. But it didn't remain anarchic very long because um, uh, it's sort of like a, like a, like, like a, 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 a cohort of junior high students may be anarchic on day one. But by day, you know, 15 or 16, it's not anarchic anymore because they've, they've had to have lunch in the same cafeteria 15 times. And so they're starting to kind of work out who's who, right? Who am I in this world? Well, you know, a lot of who you are, at least when I was in junior high school, is determined by which table in the cafeteria I sat at. Uh, colleges and universities in the United States created associational systems to help them figure out which table in the cafeteria they were sitting at. Um, and one of the most important ones in higher education history in the US has been athletics. What kind of school am I? I'm the kind of school that, that plays football with these other schools, right? The Ivy League is a football association. The Big Ten originally is a football association. The Pac-12 is, is another athletic association. Um, but there are lots of prof you know, professional associations and leagues of various sorts um, that have um, uh, enabled enabled colleges and universities to, to kind of think about who they were. So we get to the early 20th century with a ton of schools um, from, with a lot of different intellect, uh, ideological backgrounds and traditions um, and this sort of associational system that lets them figure out who they are relative to each other. And you can ask and answer, ask, ans, ask me questions whenever you want. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from my remarks on, uh, in this section, it's that war is really good for higher education. Right? A enormous geopolitical conflict is great for higher education in the United States because, because over the course of the 20th century, the United States used colleges and universities to, to manage and forward their global ambitions in a wide array of, uh, in a wide array of um, domains. And we'll just start here about the Cold Specifically, the Cold War was great for higher education. Here's why. Because one, we officially weren't at war. Okay, there was no war. What we were doing instead was demonstrating the ideological supremacy of the United States in global discourses about virtuous societies, right? We weren't the Soviet Union, 
we were the United States. And, and we weren't Sweden, we weren't a welfare state, we were the United States. And instead of building that clunky, complicated welfare state that, that, that our colleagues and our friends in Europe and, and Scandinavia built, we, we just, in the space of 25 years, we built the largest and most accessible higher education system in world history, boom, right? Social mobility, American style, college for all, right? That was part, it was an essential part of the story Americans told themselves about how, about how social mobility appropriately worked in this country. And it was also a story that we told the rest of the world about, so it was a story about hard work and perseverance and getting a little bit further than your parents and using education as a sort of primary ladder of, of that transition. Um, and it's in this period that um, schools like mine uh, really became, frankly, extraordinarily wealthy um, because they're, they, 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 well, my school, <laughs> my, my 8,000 8, acres of, of prime real estate halfway between San Francisco. Get, are you sitting, get, get this. This is, this is how the American welfare state works. You can't make this up, all right? 8,000 acres of prime real estate halfway between San Francisco and, and San Jose on the, on the edge of a vast frontier with perfect weather, tax exempt from day one, right? Every palm tree, every blade of grass, every dollar in the endowment, tax exempt. And then, and then we get massive contracts to build bombs and linear accelerators and, and create you know, world-changing social science that will eliminate hunger in sub-Saharan Africa, and medicines that will, will cure diseases and make the world a healthier place, all underwritten by the federal government. Right? It was a great deal. It was great. It was and, and you know what? And, they, and everyone thanks us for it. They think we're wonderful. They line up around the block to try and get their kids into this thing. And then they thank us when we're done. Right? How, how does that work? Right? That's a product of the Cold War. All right. Um, things start to change, actually, when the Cold War ends. And I actually I was talking to several of your colleagues Last night, I, I, I continue to think that the end of the Cold War was like pulling the stopper on the tub of the, of the, the presumed trust and legitimacy of the whole sector kind of gradually, gradually goes out. Um, uh, wait, I'm doing this backwards. One, two, three. Uh, it's also the case, and, and be, those of you who are from Illinois, um, clearly understand this. It's also the case that from the 1980s onward, we kind of systematically reduced the capacity of our state governments to raise taxes. So, uh, um, so even if we wanted to keep funding higher education at the same levels that we had during the Cold War, it became ever harder to, to get those tax appropriations through legislatures. Um, uh, this is the relationship between the Proposition 13 in California and the gradual erosion of the once great University of California system. Um, uh, so there's this kind of, in addition to the end of the Cold War, there's a sort of general change in the, in the state financing for higher education, um, which makes it um, harder for, for public institutions to get money. Uh, so there's a kind of gradual uh, decline in support for basic infrastructure. We spend a lot of money um, enabling students to get loans, but we don't build we don't build capacity in the same way that we did 20 years ago. Um, and then there's this kind of spectacular unabated cost price escalation in tuition. I call it cost price because no one's sure how much higher education should cost. In fact, we don't even know what higher education should be. Like, what is the kind of minimum standard for adequate high college? Yeah. You know how we used to answer that question? Let the colleges tell us. Colleges can tell us what it means to be an educated person, and we'll pay for it. No sweat. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, but it, but, but we, the, the sector itself let costs and prices escalate faster than the rate of inflation for three decades. And, and now we're kind of wondering, how much more cost elasticity is left in that thing? Right? How much more are people willing to pay? And frankly, how much more is the federal government willing to underwrite in the form of subsidized grants and loans? Because that's how we did it. We raised our prices, and the federal government 
uh, and the federal government subsidized it with loans. And then my colleagues in social sciences said, go ahead and go into debt. It's fine because it's good debt and you'll earn it back over the rest of your life. So we were all kind of complicit in this, in this ratcheting up of, of, of the cost of college. But suffice it to say, we're, you know, no one's quite sure that um, that uh, escalation is sustainable. It's not a happy picture now, right? You're kind of sad. There's a little smiley, frowny face, right? Like, OK, OK, yeah, it should be. It's kind of sad. It's kind of scary, right? Um, there's been this transfer of costs of college from the public sector to individuals and their families um, in the form of subsidized grants and loans. There's this ever more intense competition for the same students because students are moving more than they ever have before. Um, uh, uh, so you have to sort of think uh, well beyond your region. Um, and then there's these n new players who have entered the sector. Um, the for-profit uh, for colleges get a lot of the oxygen, but also the learning management system companies, the, on the various online service providers, um, the third-party contractors that some National Lewis students probably contract with for their dormitories in the loop. I mean, it's a very complicated business sector that's emerged uh, to meet the needs of, of, of this ongoing, almost insatiable demand for higher education. Um, so you, we're in a very, uh, uh, we're in a, an ever more um, variegated organizational domain. Okay, wait, it gets sadder, and then I'll get happier again. Okay, okay, here's, here's why it's harder now than ever to be an educator in this sector. Here's why it's harder. The ethics are cumulative. You have to do all three at the same time if you're National Lewis University, okay? You have to be market savvy, but you're a tax-exempt organization. You exist in the public service. So you have to honor the privilege of your tax exemption, right? You have to be both a servant of the city of Chicago and a business in the city of Chicago. And you also have lots of obligations to play by the rules of the organizational system that you're in, right? So there's tons of compliance uh, um, and regulatory procedures that you have to meet just by because you're a college. So we're, we're, we're all kind of in this new moment in which um, we're being at, specifically on the business side, we're being asked to be entrepreneurial um, in a whole new way, and we're, we're being valued in, in ways that we haven't before. But the prior expectations of, of, of civic service haven't, haven't gone away. We can't rely on steady funding from government sources. We know that, right? Um, like I said, we have to be both service and market-oriented. And we can't just think about Chicago anymore. We have to think about, or, 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 or Tennessee anymore. We have to think about you know, where our students might go and who might provide services to our students in our zip code but aren't us, right? Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complicated domain. And I dare say that the, um, neither the government nor the philanthropic community supporting higher education, I, I would say, fully recognizes just how complicated this domain is and just how many things often, frankly, under-resourced schools are being asked to do at the same time. Um, uh, so I think this is another reason why, you know, sort of thinking about the organizations is really important. All right, where we're headed. I promise the story gets better. Uh, lifelong learning, lifelong learning, right? So we're gonna, we're, uh, unquestionably, we're gonna be entering a domain in which um, people are never going to be able to think about completing their, uh, their adult education. They're going to be needing to fit education into the, into the rhythm of, of life and family uh, and work um, you know, throughout adulthood. Uh, we're entering a world of, of multiple and hybrid learning platforms. In fact, we're in a multiple hybrid learning platform right now. Anyone who is checking their email, or Googled me during this discussion is living in a multi-platform world, right? There's the first platform, the physical co-presence. That is shockingly expensive, right? Like, let's not even try to add up the opportunity costs that are represented in this room at this moment, right? Thank you, Gates Foundation. That's just a piece of the puzzle, right? Every hour that we have devoted to be here physically at the same time is a 
precious resource, right? My sense is that we squander that resource more than we leverage it, right? We, uh, we know that physical presence is a useful and valuable thing, but, um, but it's really expensive, um, you know, relative to these. And so, um, uh, you know, we will be looking at a world in which um, there will be a lot more different ways of interacting educationally uh, through digital media, but we'll, but we'll be changing the character of face-to-face -face interaction as well. Um, there's an imperative to measure learning and tangible returns. The days in which we say, oh, we decided you're educated, so here's your diploma and you're done. Those days are over. It's not clear how, how learning and returns should be, uh, should be measured. I was thinking about this when I was coming over. Let's, everyone likes this idea of, you know, measure, measure learning and returns. Okay, so let's say you all went home after this session and your boss said, I would like some valid and reliable data demonstrating that the time I allowed you to spend in Chicago was demonstrably valuable to this organization. I need valid and reliable evidence that each conference you attend demonstrably contributes to the value proposition of this organization. Well, I have this questionnaire, you know, that asked how I liked session two, and you know, I got this business card from Tom Dawson, and, right? <laughs> right, but we're, we're entering a world in which it's like basically people with money are presuming that we're supposed to have valid and reliable measures of every instructional intervention. It sounds really good until you go like, well, how do I apply it to freshman year? Not, not so sure, right? So we're gonna have to do something um, that is arguably going to have very, con how we figure out how to do that is going to have very fateful effects on, on the character of education that we produce. Valid and reliable measures. I learned that from my friends in economics. They love it. They think it's all true. Um, okay. Um, there's an expectation of lower costs and prices. Well, of course there's an expectation of lower costs and prices. Of course, there's, of course there's an expectation of lower costs and prices. How couldn't there be, right? And, and then there's gonna be ever more competition for what we do. Okay, that's the sad part. But why is it a good time? It's a good time to be in higher education for the exact same reasons that it's a hard time, right? Everyone is saying we have to learn all our lives. We've been saying that forever. We say that in, we tell that to our children in kindergarten, right? You're beginning a lifelong journey of learning. Learning never stops, right? That's what we're here for. Multiple learning platforms, right? You don't have to fly to Chicago and go through O'Hare and sit at a round table, and, right? Eat Danish. You can like do it in a whole different way. Might cost less, might be more interesting, might be more fun, right? There's an, an emphasis on learning. What do you know? People are supposed to learn stuff in college. I mean, it's, it's, it seems fundamental, but it's a, it's a, it is a fun, it's element, simple, but it's a fundamental shift. Actually learning, huh? Not just sitting there, not just earning credits, right? But learning something. And an opportunity to measure learning. Into, this, is, this is great opportunity for science and social science. God, really? Could we actually maybe measure that? And I'll tell you what, that's, what the, that's why this is so fun. Because this, when the instructional interaction goes like this, every keystroke interaction is a piece of data about an interaction between a learner and an instructional provider. Right? There's, no, there's no black box anymore, at least on the, on the, on the, on the, on the mechanics of, of, of tracing learning. Um, you know, if we, can do, if, if we could do for college what Netflix does for movie choices, right? Whoa, right? Could be fun, right? Um, and there's an expectation of lower, lower unit costs and prices. And if, you know, if, you're, if you've ever put a child through college, right, or, or are going to be faced with that dilemma, um, you know, I think we're at a moment when uh, our, the, our, our need to be creative is really being is really being forced, and, and, and here's why it's a good time to be, because there's only more demand, worldwide demand for adult educational services in English or Chinese 
forever. Like, this is a sector that will only grow. People will only want more of what we have to offer. Um, we just have to think in new ways about um, and what, that, what that provision is going to look like. But um, I'm here to tell you um, the market looks good. That's it. We have some time. Uh, I, mean, I guess the question would be, you talked about the measurements. I, I would just kind of elucidate a little bit, get in a little more detail on how do you think um, this whole accountability around the value, I mean, what do you think the, the measurement structures that are part of the viable for us to assess whether people are getting, including my own children, are getting anything out of your education? Do you think there's anybody making any progress in that measurement activity? Uh, yes, actually. Um, I, I actually think the Obama administration made a substantial m move in the right direction um, by, by issuing the, the scorecard recently. Um, uh, we, Wasn't that the first original Oh, yeah, 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 but, but wait, but let's, let's go see. This is the first time that the federal government publicly broke down its data on higher education by school. Okay, that had never happened before. That's a big deal, right? So um, I, think we, I think we lose sight of just how um, immune to measurement the sector has been. Um, I personally think that's a mark, like I said earlier, of the prestige and trust and affection that we have for schools. You know, we don't measure churches usually or synagogues, right? Um, you know, usually in a family, we leave the measurement to the people at school. You know, we don't subject our children to rubrics, right? Um, at home, right? We leave the measurement to, to others. And so um, I think that absence of measurement is a, is a, is a sign of, of affection for, for higher education. But the fact that we're even, even moving in the direction of specifying um, um, outcomes, say, by school. I also am also positively impressed that, the, um, that there is very quickly being pushed back on only using earnings returns as a mechanism of measuring value. I mean, I'm very impressed by that, that people are saying, well, yes, earnings returns from college are, you know, important, but it's not the only value that we should be trying to, trying to assess. Um, so that's what I would say. We're, we're very early in a conversation, and as long as we don't, we, as long as we don't limit that conversation to wages, nor need we, because it turns out people have happier personal lives, and they're less likely to smoke or be obese and abuse their children. The more education that they have, I mean, there are a lot of positive values to formal education, um, and we should talk about those and, and think about how to specify them. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, no, you were first. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to echo your point. I think what we're dealing with layer in our philosophy piece about we have we have lost anything. We just keep layering it in because you know when the GI Bill was passed, there was strong opposition among the top leaders in higher education. In the GI Bill. In fact, that institution you mentioned here in Chicago, the leadership of that was opposed. Harvard was opposed. They thought it was going to destroy the quality of the culture, etc. of higher education. And we still see, so while we're moving, I agree with all you said about the move to market and all that, but we're still hearing a lot of conversation around, you know, college isn't for everybody. Uh, you know, it's not appropriate. Some people have another path they should take. Even though we see data that shows of the 2.9 million good jobs created since the recovery began, 2.8 million were filled with people's baccalaureate degrees. Even when we see that data, we're still saying, well, some people, some people, in, in the late 40s, was a student with disabilities. People thought they ought to stay in bed. Uh, and, and today, it's certain kids, because they look a certain way, that may not be here. So I, I just, I think we're dealing with all of the challenges of every era you mentioned. So it's a pleasant question. I'm agreeing with you. All the challenges of each era are still sort of baked in to the conversation we're having to try to move forward in the way that we talk about. Because I hear all of that, mm -hmm. almost daily. But you hear every, every piece that you mentioned is still baked in. Thank you. Thank you for that. The, um, the, my, my own argument, uh, my own scholarly argument is, is higher education is a, is a, is a 
the central component of the American welfare state, basically. It's a, well, it's a, it's a system of social provision. It's a complicated system of social provision. National Lewis University is kind of partly an agent of the state of Illinois and partly an agent of the federal government and partly governed by its board of directors and partly part of the organizational fabric of the city of Chicago. It's several things at once, but, but it is always a, a system of, 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 of providing broad-based opportunity. So I think if we, if we could, if we could uh, remind ourselves of the civic complexity of college while we're talking about, say, price and earnings returns, I think we could have a much more substantial conversation. Yeah. The problem right now, though, is higher education is reflecting the inequality, the growing inequality that you see in society as a whole. So when you look at 2010 census data, or community survey data, you see that 24-year-olds in the top income quartile, 80% of them have a four-year degree. I mean, to not get a college degree when you're wealthy, you almost have to like do something, throw yourself off. Let me. The let me but if you go, yeah, just, if you yeah. go to the next quartile, the third quartile. Solid middle class, barely more than a third. Of course, when you go to the lower class, it's ten percent. So we're seeing, I think, uh, I, we should be the vehicle for addressing the inequality problem. In the but but Sanford, for example, has made little progress in increasing the numbers of students of color and and low income students. It's made substantial progress, actually, and we only have five thousand. So, so, the recent study of elite private institutions showed the percentages didn't grow very much for any person. Maybe Stanford's an exception. But, but, but the point is, we are, in some ways, because of cost, because of other things, we are becoming rapidly a part of the problem, not a part of the solution in terms of inequality in this country. But we are giving college degrees to those who already are in fairly low well position, and we're denying college degrees. To those who most uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm a lot of I got I got a lot of But let's move around. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Adam Lyons, Post Service Foundation of Chicago. Thank you very much for asking for the President. Thinking about, in particular, the things you're talking about in terms of moving towards learning and sort of shock and learning as being a key element of what college and university should be doing. Can you speak a little bit about cultural change, particularly the faculty? and what the challenges and opportunities might be as it relates to all of the sort of past that has built up in terms of college and university culture and faculty administrations and how that can be uh, unstuck and many of us have stuck and it's our opportunity to lever that for including the yeah. um, uh, We kind of get over caring so much about tenure faculty. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> I'm on the bus. So we can, it can run out of gas now, okay? No, I mean, it's easy for me to say, right? Um, uh, but, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the um, faculty labor has already been casualized, okay? The vast majority of, of people who provide adult instruction are not on the tenure line. Um, they are not systematically rewarded for doing research. But yet, I think our conversation is stuck on this image of, 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 you know, curmudgeonly resistant tenured faculty. You know, most people, I, I mean, most people who are providing instruction have a different labor relation. Um, and I'm seeing e e extraordinary creativity. There's this whole new instructional design. Oh my God, instructional design. I mean, this thing is amazing. This started in World War II when the federal government needed we needed, a, we needed to train people to, to do stuff very efficiently. So instructional, there are a few, I don't know if there's a program here in Chicago, there probably is. So it's, um, it's a little bit of, of, of aesthetics and design, a little bit of pedagogical content knowledge, um, and now some engineering, because you have to do the instructional design for one of these, right? Um, but you know, a, 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 an efflorescence of great creativity in people who are, and, and, the, and, the, and the growth of the private sector. Boy, oh boy, I mean, you know, you put private capital behind something, it goes really fast. So um, I think we should need to change our frame, get over the tenured faculty who teach comparative literature and sort of think about the instructional labor force more broadly. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff we can do really fast. Really fast. Yes. yes. So, um, 
It's not slow and sticky at all. The only thing that's slow and sticky about higher education is the iconography of higher education. The mortar boards and the tassels and the diplomas and the campuses and the commencements, that stuff hasn't changed, right? The, the kind of academic drag hasn't changed, but everything else is really dynamic. Um, in the next five years, um, what, what are the things that I, there's, there, is, there is going to be some new uh, system for uh, accounting for uh, government funding. That will happen, right? Um, one way or another, we're going to have to explain and justify our receipt of Pell Grants and, and subsidized loans in a new way. The, the big question for me, the big opportunity for me as far as I'm concerned is, um, I think we're at a moment where colleges and universities can offer that solution to federal funders rather than the other way around. If we say, we're gonna use the privilege of self-governance and make good on it by offering ways of measuring ourselves that will, um, uh, that will appease that expectation, that's one. The thing I really lose sleep about is I don't wanna, I don't wanna wake up tomorrow morning and find that this has all become the realm of the Federal Trade Commission. I do not want higher education to be defined as a, as a new consumer sector and that people, the primary relation that we're, that we're regulating is, is, a, is a purchase relation. I would like higher education to continue to be defined as a service sector and subject to, I mean, clearly people are spending money and you know, deserve to have their investments uh, you know, wisely governed, but uh, I, 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 I really want us to protect the integrity of, of an instructional and educational relationship. And I worry that if we're not very proactive in defining what the terms of a, of a reasonable instructional relationship are, um, then another regulatory agency is going to do it for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to be talking to the University. I have two questions. One thing is ecology, the other thing is dimension. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm open now. Okay. So okay. So, the first question what might be said about the broader ecology in which Asian finds itself, particularly the interlinks between secondary and elementary? Okay. 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 not even necessarily a public entity, it could be a private entity. Like, yeah, okay, okay, right. What would a consumer reports of higher education look like? Um, on the first question, I'm gonna, um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, push back a little bit on what seems to be part of the operant framing of this convening, which is um, uh, the, re uh, uh, the relationship between secondary and post-secondary education. I think. In, from a policy standpoint, it makes perfect sense to think about a continuous uh, trajectory from early childhood into adult education, a sort of K-16 kind of logic. I think that makes a lot of sense from a, from a policy standpoint. From a, from a under, from a, well, that's not, not right. 
from a from a from a uh, from a let me say from a developmental standpoint, if we're thinking about the well-being of the learner, thinking about the relationship between those different sectors is really important. In terms of rulemaking for the sector, I think it's really important to distinguish K-12 and post-secondary education because the regulatory landscape is just spectacularly different. I mean, what's great about higher education is that they're, you get to deal with grown-ups. Right? I mean, they're legal, functional adults. So the whole way in which you have to think about privacy and consent and the distribution of, of funds is just very different at the K-12 level. So you know, obviously, we want to have you know, coordination between high school and college curriculum. And I do think my colleague Mike Kirst has written about this at length. I mean, the Common Core will change a lot <laughs> um, uh, in the post-secondary sector. But I think we have to think about as living things, colleges are different than high schools. And so we have to sort of, we have to keep that in mind um, as, we're, as we're planning. Uh, on the other, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's right. You were, you were very um, equivocal in your, in, your, in, your, in your vocalization, so I'm not sure which you would prefer. Um, you know, I'm enough of a paternalist um, that I actually, I actually believe higher education can govern itself. And I think it, it, I would prefer to live in a higher education that is defined largely by self-governance than by third-party governance. Um, you know, how we do that um, is an open question. And then also I will say, how we do that in a sector that isn't going to increasingly be, have public actors and private for-profit actors. Right? Like, who gets, to, who gets to govern ourselves? Does, the, does Capella University get to govern itself? Right? Um, the same way that DeVry does? And what would, that, what would a governance system look like that would accommodate um, for-profit players? Okay, we have yeah. time for one more okay. question. Someone else is gonna tell me who's, a, who's gonna ask. I don't know who to call on, so. <laughs> so right just. Is this on? I'm going to toss the bouquet. Oh. Yeah, I'm just listening. Yeah. I grabbed it. OK. I, I, I don't know if this is a question as much as maybe a reaction. Who are you? Statement. My name is Bruce Friend, uh, mm -hmm. and I work for the International Association of Oh, OK. Oh, OK. I mean, I, 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 my, my strong sense is what you said, my guess is that what you said resonates with a lot of people in the room. I will, um, uh, there are some philanthropies in the room, so I'll, 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 put, a, I'll put a wish on the list that I think res perhaps responds to what you're talking about. Um, the, and this actually responds to your, your question as well. The student record is completely up for grabs. Like, what should 
documentation of educational attainment and learning look like in a LinkedIn world? Should we just sign all of our academic transcripts over to LinkedIn and let them figure it out? Right? Because that's kind of what they're doing now, all right? I mean, um, uh, uh, basically digitally based um, uh, certification and, verifi and credential verification services um, are, you know, are, are rapidly developing in the private sector. Should the federal government develop a blockchain model um, of irrevocable uh, 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 data keeping so that so we could have academic records take the structure of, say, Bitcoin? Right? Should we, uh, should we eliminate every registrar's office from every of the 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States and nationalize that somehow? Um, uh, I mean, it seems like an awkward answer to your question, but I really think the, the, the big challenge in the digital era is, is going to think about how, um, how the integrity of academic records of individuals as they move through a very complicated string of organizational relationships is going to look. Um, I think that's an opportunity for, specifically for philanthropies to uh, sort of to, to help the whole sector think through a very large administrative problem. Thank you.